The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Well, did you miss me? Hey, welcome to episode 128 of the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Yes, indeed, after a very restful vacation, I am back and bringing you more authors and their stories. And today's guest is an exceptional one, to say the least, for I had the pleasure of speaking with California author Matthew Wayne Selznick. Matthew is a creator who likes to make all kinds of things, with also a heart for helping others make stuff too. We discuss his origin story and how that was formed from a childhood in comics, uh, with the stories behind comics, and how those stories still connect with him today. Uh, we also we also learn about that passion he has for helping others. All that before diving into several of his own books, including a sample from his latest book, The Light of the Outsider. It's a fantasy thriller, which is just riveting. I got caught up listening to it. It's amazing. You're going to love it. And uh, I I just can't wait to share this episode for you. So it's a very exciting interview. And that's coming up in just a moment. So stay tuned for that. Well, I have to say, it's for as restful as my vacation was. It's good to be back here doing this again, talking with you, my friends, all over the world. I really appreciate all the emails and comments I got uh, while I was gone. Uh, went away to two different campsites here in Missouri. I was gone with uh, my family and some of my wife's family for a little while throughout the 4th of July weekend, which was really nice. It was good to catch up with them and, and uh, visit for a while before my wife and I came. We actually came home for a day, kind of <laughs> kind of uh, reload and and repack and then she and I went away for a week we went to a little place called the River of Life Farm in Dora Missouri which is in the southern portion of Missouri the southern mid portion of, uh, of Missouri in the Ozarks and it's uh, it was a treehouse cabin right on this river and it was just the most peaceful place I have ever been I- I've got to say and I mean and I and I lived in Alaska for a while which was great and all, but holy cow, we sat on the deck, watched deer come along, we saw mama deer, you know, nursing her baby, uh, I got to do some fly fishing, and I wish I could say I caught some, but my fly fishing (laughs) techniques are subpar right now, but still, it was, oh my gosh, you you guys have got to try it out, you got to go check this place out, it's amazing, and uh, just... (sighs) Considering I was at an RV park before, and so you got the constant noise around you, uh, all the other campgrounds, you know, the people playing music or whatever, which, you know, that's fine. That's, that's the way, it, that's what happens. Um, and then I go here where you hear nothing but the river or the sounds of nature. Holy cow, it was amazing. So I did do some writing while I was gone. Started Actually, I started a brand new, uh, I think it's going to be a short story which uh, that was awesome woke up every morning and worked on that for a little while and um, i haven't worked on it too much since i've been back because been so busy catching up on other things but still it's it's exciting i'm looking forward to getting back into it because it was i think it's going to be really good it's going to be really exciting Uh, and hopefully i can get that knocked out this year but uh yeah once we got back though man i had a lot of behind the scenes items i had to take care of with the show uh things I had to work on, including following up with, uh, as I said, all the emails that I'd received. Uh, interestingly, I've also discovered that I have I have a lot of people either coming to the Sample Chapter website and clicking the link for my personal author website, or they're searching me and finding my author website at jasonamiski.com. Uh, which was interesting. I never expected people to contact me that way. It, it's happened once or twice in the past and it's like you know once every six months I'll I'll get an email through my contact submission form on my website 
but I had several waiting for me when I got back. So that was interesting. And I need to, I need to make sure people are going to samplechapterpodcast.com and you can uh, reach out to me through there. We have the email samplechapterpodcast at gmail.com, which is how you can contact the show directly. If you have a, a suggestion or if you are an author that you'd like to come on the show, then reach out to me that way. Um, any of those ways. I also have the phone number now as well, so you can call or text, leave me a voicemail, and the number there is 660-851-1146. So I've had a little bit of work to do on the website. I want to kind of touch that up a little bit, make sure that it's more visible so people see that, hey, here's the email or here's the phone number, you know, reach out to me that way. And I don't know. Uh, I I need to just make sure that that's uh, people are finding me that way instead of through my other because, ironically, my website was not connecting the emails. That, that it wasn't forwarding the emails to me, so I just happened to look over on my website. But anyway, glad I got that settled and sorted out. Uh, along with contacting me the, in those uh, through the website, the email, and the phone number, you can also follow us on social media at Facebook and Twitter just the sample chapter podcast look up look us up there and follow the show we do I do try to post quite a bit uh, I haven't I haven't posted as much of late because I was gone and uh, I did not fill out my buffer as much as I thought <laughs> but I am back now so I'm gonna have a lot more interactions in both websites on both social media sites that we're part of so follow us there uh, but uh, yeah, another exciting thing I was able to do during that break too was was able to secure another six month sponsorship from my favorite writing software, Scrivener. They're incredible. I just love those people. They, you know, I love this software. It was great being on my vacation and still being able to access Scrivener on my tablet, uh, which is what I brought along with me. I didn't bring my laptop. I just brought my tablet and my little Bluetooth keyboard. And just tip tap, tip tap, tip tap away on my story. Pulled it up. You know, it was a new document in Scrivener, and I, I just love it. I love it, love it, love it. <laughs> and to have this wonderful working relationship I have with them, uh, I'm just I, I feel very, very fortunate to have them to have them on board again and uh, coming along for the ride. So. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and play a commercial for Scribner, but make sure you are listening for that coupon code CHAPTER that's going to save you 20% on the regular desktop version. So check this out. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scribner. Now I know you've heard about Scribner because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scribner's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing cork board, you can see why I use Scribner every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener Writing Software, built by writers for writers. Well, I don't know if this is coming across or not, but I certainly feel <laughs> a little out of touch here, a little uh, out of practice. So <laughs> this whole feature right now is going on a little bit longer than I meant for it to. <clears throat> but anyway, we're going to we're going to get through this together. <laughs> so let me also thank of course longtime sponsor U Store All out of Warrensburg, Missouri. Uh, they are the premier self-storage facility in the Warrensburg area with two locations, climate control and non-climate control, fully fenced in facilities with more than 60 cameras recording 24 hours a day. Check them out online at ustoreall.net for more information. And that is spelled the letter U S T O R A L L dot net. I also want to give a big shout out to my uh, podcast network friends, starting with Pop Goes the Culture Network. Uh, they, uh, I became part of their network a little over a year ago, and they are still trucking along throughout this whole 
pandemic that we're that we're all dealing with, and uh, they have a lot of great great shows that they are still putting out. Shows like Fanatics and the Fan, The Way Awesome Show, Amazing Nerd Show, Fellowship of the Geeks, Two Dads Review, Don't Push It, and The Multiverse Tonight. Uh, not to mention their flagship show, the Pop Goes to Culture podcast, which airs live every Thursday night on a cast channel. So make sure to click the link in the show notes for their website so you can get on over there and find out how to interact with them live on Thursday nights. I also want to thank our other network that we are very, very happy to be a part of, Project Entertainment Network. They have a whole slew of more than 30 shows, I think it's 35 shows, going on over there, podcasts that are in just tons of different wheelhouses. Uh, A lot of them are writing-related or author-related, but there's also, I think, uh, about half of them that are not writing-related. Shows like Bizong, Matters of Faith, Monster Attack, Wandering Monster, The Lunch Ladies Podcast, Hard at Work Show, Mondo Method, Unsupervised, Staring into the Abyss, Library at the End of the World, The Arm Cast, Dead Sexy Podcast, (laughs) which always makes me laugh, Uh, Your New Opinion, and so, so many others, including another one I want to make sure to uh, give a big shout out to, which is Hobbies Include Writing with host Mariah Powell. That's a really cool show. Uh, Mariah is is reading samples from a story, like as she writes it, she's then reading it on the show. So this is the down and dirty first draft story that you're hearing, uh, which which is a really unique take, I think. Uh, it, it's allowing her to, you know, put it out there in its raw form and inviting you to comment on it. Which, holy cow, that's that's awesome because you get to uh, you get to hear. Uh, here's what the original thoughts were, what she's working on with it, and what do you think? You know, she wants your feedback to see what you think of it and how it's going. Should it go in one direction or another? Awesome, awesome stuff. And I believe uh, I would have to confirm this, or you can click the link in the show notes to find out for sure. But I believe there's also two different stories that she's got at this point. There was a vampire, and then there was another one, or maybe there, maybe it's all vampires. I'm not sure exactly, but. Yeah, uh, check out this ad for the uh, Hobbies Include Writing Show, and then uh, click the link in the show notes for Project Entertainment, so you can get on over there and check out this show and so many others. What if a storytelling podcast could be an interactive experience? Hi, I'm Mariah Powell, amateur author and creator of Hobbies Include Writing, and I'm openly inviting your opinions on stories I haven't finished writing yet. Launching with my original audio novel, Blood That Binds, visit hobbiesinclude-writing.weebly.com for more about the show and look for it on a podcasting platform near you. All right, without further ado, I'm going to get us on over to our interview with today's guest, Matthew Wayne Selzman. Hello, Sample Chapner listeners. Welcome back. It's been a great vacation for me, but today I'm sitting down with Matthew Wayne Selznick. Matthew is an author, creator, and creative services provider living in Huntington Beach, California. He's the author of the Parsec Award-nominated Brave Men Run, a novel of the sovereign era, the follow-up pilgrimage, as well as his latest novel, Light of the Outsider, which we're going to hear from today. Matthew, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to have you here too. And, and I want to thank you. Uh, we have a unique relationship and that we kind of got to have a little uh, back and forth before. And you introduced me to a uh, previous guest, ML Winitsky, who read from A Fly on the Wall, which was a lot of fun. So thank you for that. No, you're welcome. You're welcome. I'm glad it all worked out. Yes, that was great. And that's part of your services. So tell us a little bit about what you do during the day. Oh, yeah. Um, My day job, if you will, is as a creative services provider. Uh, I help authors and podcasters and other creative folks 
basically bring their creative endeavors to fruition, to market, and to an audience. Uh, I work as a freelancer from home, so uh, this uh, whole stay-at-home, shelter-in-place pandemic era is really nothing different for me. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm in front of my desk, uh, you know, in front of the monitor, uh, just like always. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I, uh, I've been uh, an independent author and publisher um, since, gosh, 2005 or 1999, depending on how you want to count it, and um, done marketing for uh, that, you know, my own works and for uh, others, and uh, did a little time with a boutique uh, uh, internet marketing company, and we worked on various movie and TV shows, and so I've taken all of that sort of personal experience and professional experience. And now I use those skills to help uh, new authors and podcasters and a and, uh, couple of artists and uh, folks who come along, uh, you know, usually by referral and uh, need help getting their, their stuff out into the world. Uh, everything from editing to copywriting to website design and uh, soup to nuts, A to Z, uh, as they say. And, uh, and yeah, that's, that's how I actually uh, knew M.L. Wininski uh, because I was helping him with uh, his book release. And now yeah. here we are with my book release. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's great, though. That's, that's awesome. That I, It sounds like you're doing a great job. I know I had a really good time talking with you. And then, of course, with, with Marvin uh, was a lot of fun. And, and he had nothing but great things to talk about, uh, to say about you. So this was great. I was so happy that you reached out to me with, with your own books. And uh, just going over your collection, I mean, you've got quite the impressive collection of, you know, different uh, world building and story design. But for me, as a child of the 70s and 80s, I've got one in particular that has caught my attention, and I'm going to spring it on you here. I want to know about reading The Amazing Spider-Man, Volume 1. <laughs> <laughs> that was a labor of love. Um Reading The Amazing Spider-Man, uh, Volume 1, there never was a Volume 2, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, basically, so a little backstory. I bought my first issue of uh, The Amazing Spider-Man. I was, gosh, maybe six years old. Um, it was 1972 or 73 off the spinner rack in a drugstore. My grandmother was picking up some prescriptions. And of course I was looking at the comic books and I still have that, that issue uh, today. And it, uh, it hooked me even at that young age, I was fascinated by the fact that uh, there was so much going on in the lives of these characters, uh, so much interaction. I didn't really, I didn't have the words for soap opera or anything like that. I'd probably never seen a soap opera at six or seven years old or five or six, but, but uh, that's what it was, right? Peter mm -hmm. Parker and, and, and Gwen Stacy and Mary Jane and all these people and, and all back and forth. I don't even think he got into costume until like page eight, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, it was, it was so cool. And uh, I've been uh, a Spider-Man fan ever since. And I realized that if you read the first 12 issues of The Amazing Spider-Man, that everything for the next, what are we on, like 800 issues now? Uh, oh gosh, yeah, I all that, all, now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all the groundwork was laid in those first 12 issues. The, the relationships and the personalities, and it doesn't matter how many reboots they do or, you know, uh, retcons or new characters they introduce, or people who die, come back to life, whatever, all those core themes, including, of course, the fact that most of his villains are based on other animals, uh, it's all there. And so uh, I, I'm fascinated by the idea of creating a creative franchise right so mm -hmm. as as creators we're not just writing books we're hopefully creating things that can be repurposed into comics and films and and you know what have you um and creating worlds story worlds i call them um that and of course that's what stan lee was doing in 1963 with with uh the early marvel comics him and jack kirby and steve ditko um and uh I realized that looking at those 12 issues of, of The Amazing Spider-Man, 
I could kind of deconstruct them and have some fun with it. Uh, and that's what I did. I'm basically retelling those first 12 issues with an emphasis on storytelling and uh, writerly techniques and, and the uh, sort of kind of going behind the curtain, if, if you will, uh, and having fun too. I mean, you know, they're comics from the early 60s, so there's a lot of fun to be had. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to argue with the success that Spider-Man has become going back to those early issues. I mean, it's like absolutely. you said, they, they built a, a solid foundation of story and getting you into a relatable character that, um, you know, as, as they've said over time, it's like, this is a full body suit. So anybody could be him. Yeah. And uh, that was another part of the, uh, the dream there. So yeah, it, it, this is awesome that you get a chance to look at it from another perspective, the writer's perspective and, and glean from that. Yeah. And, and, you know, while I, I hope that it's instructional and, and interesting, Tongue is firmly in cheek as well because it's, you know, it, 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 there's 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 no way to not poke gentle loving fun at some of those early issues uh, and and uh, yeah so yeah I hope if if uh, if it caught your eye I hope you enjoy it it's uh, uh, I had fun writing it like I say it was a labor of love <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely be checking it out and it's on Kindle Unlimited everybody so why not go get yeah. it go grab yeah. a copy and it was only like a hundred and something. 130 some pages or something oh yeah yeah it's a quick read it's, it's breezy a quick read. there you go everybody <laughs> go get a copy check it out for yourself read it and leave a review tell everybody you heard hey. about it on the sample chapter podcast <laughs> <laughs> we all win <laughs> there we go there we go <laughs> so so going back then to the beginning of Matthew wanting to be a storyteller does it come from those days with the comics or is there another moment for you um, I mean, I think that it, it really does have its roots there and in, um, in going to the library uh, as a very oh. small child. Um, and a couple of things I remember. Uh, uh, there was a, uh, a record company that did basically highly uh, condensed um, adaptations of short stories and novels and whatnot on record on LP. Um, mm. I think uh, I may be mispronouncing it or misremembering it. Cadmian, I think it was. Um, but, uh, and you could check, but, yeah. you could check records out from the library and you could check film strips out from the library. And, you know, like, like, like now you can check CDs and videos and, and, you know, uh, DVDs. Um, and so having these stories read to me a lot of science fiction and fantasy and stuff and also just being encouraged to take home as many books as my arms could carry and um you know i'm i'm almost positive that's where i discovered ray bradbury and edgar rice burroughs and uh you know uh those two authors, especially Ray Bradbury. I've, I've referred to him as my story father in, in other places. It's because uh, the earliest mass market paperback that I can remember is R is for Rocket, you know, having that as a very young kid and, and reading those short stories and then the Martian Chronicles and, and then Isaac Asimov's Foundation Trilogy and the Tarzan books and on and on from there. And of course, concurrently with that, comic books um and <laughs> and i think what really what really grabbed me is and especially with with comics the um the worlds that were being built the continuity the fact that characters from different books could show up in each other's stories and interact and they all lived in the same world and then later um you know as a preteen reading stephen king and gradually realizing that the town with all the vampires was just down the, the, the freeway from the place where that rabid St. Bernard attacked and that all of the Stephen King stuff was basically in the same world and the same universe. Um, and uh, 
love that idea. And uh, Michael Moorcock is another early influence that his, all of his uh, eternal champion books, uh, Moorcock, uh, uh, Elric and Quorum and Jerry Cornelius, all those series subtly and not so subtly interweave and are connected with one another. Love the idea. And again, there it is again, right? Building a story world where not just one book or even one series, but everything an author creates kind of being part of this larger tapestry. Um, and yeah, it wasn't long before I was starting to, to piece together my own uh, stuff. Uh, my, I, I, my, the first story I remember writing, uh, I must have been, I mean, how old are you when you're, when you're learning your letters and you're, uh, I don't know if they even still do this, but you're, <laughs> but you're learning your letters on those sort of dark gray uh, landscape format pieces of paper with the very thick lines, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. Takes you back, you know, and, and again, I don't even, I'm 53 years old. I don't know what they're learning on now, probably tablets, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I remember writing a story about an evil triceratops who had kidnapped some grapes and his whole purpose was he's going to take them down to the beach and let them dry out and turn into raisins. And <laughs> I don't know, that's, uh, I do not remember how it ended, but that was the very, that's where it began at least. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then of course, you know, later on uh, in junior high and high school, writing uh, very, very short little stories, episodic stories featuring my friends and, you know, that kind of thing. And, and it all just kind of snowballed from there. I've never not been a creator of some kind, uh, whether it's words or music or uh, I, as the words and the music took precedence, the art, the actual uh, uh, drawing and painting and things like that kind of fell by the wayside, but always mm. trying to make something, always making something. And these days it's, it's mostly writing. Yeah. Long answer to a, to a quick question. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. But I mean, that's, that's what's fun about this is getting to have that conversation and, and get to experience, you know, what made you the writer you are today, the, the creator that you are today. And like for me, I mean, we're pretty close to the same age. So like I remember growing up, the same thing for me, it was like playing with the GI Joes and oh, he, and yes. he man with my neighbors and we're out in the sandbox and we've got, you know, even little green army men and we're telling our own epic stories of adventure with these guys. And it just kind of went from there, it just continued uh, to in junior high and in high school. I remember writing little stories of my friends where now we're the ones going on these adventures. It's not that our characters anymore. It's us as the character and very much the same. So I, and, I, and that's what I really love about getting to talk for a little bit with the authors and hearing how much alike a lot of us are in our origin stories. Indeed. Indeed. To give it a yeah. superhero turn. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. You mentioned the army men and stuff like that for me. I mean, sure. Army men and, and, and dinosaur figures and stuff like that. But for me, it was the micronauts. Mm -hmm. Remember those toys? Oh, my oh yeah. <laughs> and then there was a comic book to go along with it. What? <laughs> Yeah. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, it was great. It was great. <laughs> but exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you create, uh, create, creating worlds. You know, uh, whether it's uh, in in the in the forest down the street from your house with your friends, or or in your room with the action figures, or or on paper. It's it's. I think uh, we're just driven to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so. Another one of the books that caught my attention, and I think I think it was one we mentioned in the uh, at the top of this interview, was the Sovereign Era, Year One. Tell us about this and and how this came to be. Okay, um, the Sovereign Era is probably the story world I'm I'm most known for. Um, I can I'll give you the uh, I'll give you another rambling answer. <laughs> uh, in uh, in the very late nineties, ninety seven, ninety eight, dawn of the internet, right, uh, or dawn of the web, at least. Um, I, I had read, a, an X-Men novel, not a graphic novel, but a, a prose novel. And it was just awful, uh, <laughs> <laughs> terrible. Uh, and, 
classic situation. I thought I could do better than this. Oh uh, yes. So, so, and you know, I was probably what 30, 35 or so. And, and, uh, if I got the math right. And, um, and, uh, so I, I hearkened back to some of those original superhero stories I had written uh, as a teenager and thought, you know, maybe there's something there. And ended up creating uh, a, a webzine, uh, an online magazine called Sovereign Serials. And this was, like I say, right around 1998 till around 2001 or so. And it was basically uh, episodic, ongoing serials uh, in prose form um, of this alternate history where in April of 1985, superpowered individuals reveal themselves to be living here on Earth with us and, uh, you know, have one way or the other kind of always been here. And, um, and I ran, uh, there were maybe five or six individual serials um, three that I wrote, and then some that were written by contributors. And I just gradually, much like in the comics, just gradually built this world, um, this setting uh, of the sovereign era, the sovereigns being these superpowered people. Um, and when Sovereign Serials, the webzine, sort, sort of wound down, I kept getting emails um, from folks who wanted to know what happens to Nate Charters the character in one of those serials. Mm. And so, you know, <laughs> occasional and small though they were, the public kept speaking. And so I, uh, that became my first novel was basically uh, rewriting and finishing the serial that involved Nate Charters. And that was my first book, Brave Men Run, which came out in uh, the fall of uh, 2005. And so Brave Men Run was the first book, first novel uh, in history, as far as I know. Uh, it's been a while now, so if, if I'm wrong, somebody should have come forward and said, but as far <laughs> as I know, it was the first novel in history to have a simultaneous release in paperback, five different ebook formats, and podcast formats. Wow. So you could buy the ebook. Uh, and yes, 2005, you could buy an ebook for your Palm Pilot or for uh, your, I remember that. <laughs> your Sony Reader or, uh, yeah, there were, there were a few out there. The Kindle didn't exist yet. Um, you could buy it in, in ebook formats. You could buy it as a paperback or you could listen to the free podcast. And uh, I, was, I wasn't the first person to do that. I was among the first two dozen or so uh, independent authors to, to do that, to put it out as a podcast. And um, through the sort of uh, unusual nature of that, um, a lot of people who were podcasting were interested in that, um, which gave me lots of opportunities to get on their shows and not just talk about Brave Men Run, but talk about podcasting and independent media and uh, podcast novels, because back in those days, the first question was, are you crazy? You're giving away your book for free. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a marketing technique, right? Uh, it, right. It, sold, it sold ebooks, it sold paperbacks. And there were some months when voluntary donations to the podcast uh, surpassed any other form of, of revenue from that book. Um, so that was the beginning of the sovereign era cycle uh, of books. Um, I gathered together uh, seven or eight of my peers in the podcast novelist sort of realm. <laughs> People like Mer Lafferty, who's gone on to write Star Wars tie-in books, and uh, uh, J.C. Hutchins, who had a very popular uh, series of novels uh, with his Seventh Son series, and people like... Uh, Nathan Lowell and uh, Matt Wallace and, and uh, uh, got all these folks together and invited them to write stories that take place in the Sovereign era, um, sort of after the events of Brave Men Run. So, mm. um, and to cover the next 12 months in that history. And so that's what the Sovereign era year one is, as a collection of, uh, of those stories set in that, in that story world. Um, which was served, and then there's a short story called uh, The World Revolves Around You that is also sort of in that 
time frame, but I, that, I wrote that and I didn't want to put it in the anthology of these other authors. So that's just a standalone short story. I wanted, you know, let's not have the <laughs> editor put his own story in, in his collection, you know, <laughs> let these other people shine and, and shine they did. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, and then the second uh, Sovereign Era novel, Pilgrimage, picks up a year after Brave Men Run. So uh, slowly telling the story. And Pilgrimage is kind of a, a follow-up to Brave Men Run. It features many of the same characters and kind of closes that loop. Um, and there have been, um, let's see, uh, there's been one other, uh, two other Sovereign Era uh, short stories and uh, novellas since then. There are at least three other novels uh, to come in that setting. And I also do a, uh, an intermittently released free serial on my own website, mattselznick.com, called Hazy Days and Cloudy Nights. And that takes place the year before Brave Men Run. Um, and uh, so, wow. you know, lots yeah. of different stories to tell, lots of, lots of uh, toys in the sandbox there. And, um, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, for the, the, the idea there is to tell the, the history of the last, you know, uh, 15, 20 years or so of the 20th century uh, in this world where basically metahumans appear at the height of the Cold War. Uh, and how does that change things and what happens and um, how does society change? And really, like most of my writing, what does it mean to be human? You know, mm -hmm. uh, so that's, uh, that's the sovereign era with uh, <laughs> Brave Men Run and, and all the rest. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. And it, you know, and it was one of those things that I, I saw the Sovereign Era popping up on a few of these, uh, you know, the other books, and it was part of a thing, you know, a, a, a bigger picture here. So I, I, I was like, oh gosh, I got to just pick one and, and let's run with it and see where <laughs> this goes. So that was that was sounds amazing though, and it's amazing artwork, uh, amazing sounding stories, and I gotta say too. Brave Men Run and Pilgrimage. I love the artwork. It's got such an 80s throwback look to it, like Max Headroom kind of a feel to it. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, yeah. That artist is, uh, that cover artist for those two books is Neil Von Flew. Uh, he is amazing. Uh, his work, search him up on the Google. Uh, his work, he works in a number of different mediums. I told him what I wanted for those covers and he delivered immediately, but he also works in full oil he sculpts he does murals he's uh he's uh kind of a genius uh, <laughs> I, I was uh i was lucky to get him uh it's, it's funny we actually worked together uh in the early 90s or mid 90s uh at a bookstore and uh uh got back in touch years later i'm like oh hey what do you know you're an artist hmm <laughs> tucked that in the back of my head and uh, when the time came uh no, he's done. He's done covers for uh, uh, Neil Stephenson's. Um, oh man, what was that series of books that Neil Stephenson did? Uh, an alternate history that takes that, like basically, what if uh, Genghis Khan hadn't been stopped? Um, and it, it uh, I can't remember the name of it, but oh. but yeah, he's he's the real deal. Uh, is, uh, Neil is uh, Neil von Flew. So all credit to him for those covers. I I also love the way they came out, and they're they're of a piece. The cover for um, uh, for the Sovereign Era Year One, um, and I'm going to be on the spot right now. It's been many many years since I've talked to the guy, but uh, that's another one where I found an artist who um, was doing all this role playing game art. He did the uh, cover for the uh, Game of Thrones role-playing game. And, and it just so happened that somebody I knew knew him. And, uh, you know, folks are willing to do stuff. Uh, independent creators tend to help each other out and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, work for reduced rates and stuff. So, yeah, with both Neil and, and with the cover artist of Sovereign Era Year One, I was definitely, uh, I was... Uh, out of my weight class on the, with those folks and, and very, very, <laughs> great, very grateful. <laughs> That's one of those things that I, it's like we were talking before uh, being a creator. Uh, I used to love to draw. I used to love to draw and paint and do all kinds of stuff. I still have a few of my pieces that were the better ones. Um, but yeah, as, as I got older, 
I didn't want to put that much work into something that maybe I'd hang on the wall or maybe it would get destroyed. I didn't know. Um, and I, my interest went more into the storytelling than that. And now I'm like, like when I was writing my first book, I thought, Oh, maybe I'll do a uh, cover for it and quickly realized, <laughs> no, I'm not doing this. This is not my cup of tea. I cannot do this. <laughs> My my rule for my own self-published work is for the, if I release a short story, you know, as a standalone little short story, a little 99 cent thing, um, I can go ahead and throw a cover together, you know, with mm -hmm. some, uh, uh, with some public domain art and, and whatnot. And, uh, but for the novels, for the book length stuff, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and invest in somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but that's great though. I mean, and it's, that's another one of the things that I think creators do is like you said, we, we meet other creators and you, I don't know how many cards I have collected in my, just in the last few years going to events or meeting people online. I'm like, Oh, I like that work. I'm going to save that in a folder here on my computer and, for a rainy day and you never know Dude. when all of a sudden you've got somebody who's like, I, I got, I, I think I know the perfect person to reach out to. Exactly. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> all right. Well, let's move on over to our book of the day here. Light of the outsider. This looks amazing. Tell us about this. So light of the outsider is the first book in the shapers world story world. Um, the Shaper's World is a wholly original um, fantasy setting. Um, this is not Earth medieval times with dragons and orcs and elves. It's literally another planet. Uh, and so from the ground up, uh, not your Tolkien fantasy, not your Dungeons and Dragons fantasy story. Mm. Um, and And... The basic idea here uh, in Light of the Outsider, it's a standalone book um, and it's the first in a trilogy. Uh, and so you can read this and uh, you will come to the end and it will truly be an end, but there will be two more books carrying on the larger story. Um, so you can, you can jump in now and then, you know, not be cliffhangered at the end. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, basically light of the outsider is a fantasy thriller, uh, kind of a cross genre hybrid. Uh, it is at its heart, a caper tale. Uh, it involves the kidnapping of for, for, uh, we'll use the shorthand for, uh, of the, the prince, the, the infant prince of the realm has been kidnapped and uh, some desperate people uh, come together to, uh, for different reasons and for, uh, to different ends, uh, try to find and or rescue the prince or prevent him from being rescued. And behind it all is a much larger threat that, uh, uh, threatens not just the the sort of stability of the realm because the heir has been kidnapped, but uh, so there's there's international pressures and international tension and uh, a greater threat that really is uh, cosmic horror wouldn't be wouldn't be putting uh, putting it too too lightly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so there's a little bit of 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 like I say it's it's a bit of a hybrid. It's uh, it's a kind of a gritty street level fantasy novel uh, structured like a, like a thriller, like a caper story uh, uh, with some um, kind of otherworldly horror mixed in uh, as a, as a light garnish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it's, uh, there are, to be at least planned out, there are there will be six uh, Shapers World novels to kind of complete this. Uh, so two trilogies basically to kind of uh, complete the arc. And but I've also got plans for uh, a bunch of bridging short stories that will kind of fill the gaps between the novels and uh, a couple of serials and lots of plans for the Shapers World story. And it all all starts with with Light of the Outsider. Wow. Okay. So do you find it, do you find it more challenging to work in stories within our world or in a 
imaginary sci-fi fantasy otherworldly uh, area? I, I, I think there's different challenges. Um, I mean, first of all, my primary focus in pretty much everything that I write, even if there are big, like widescreen epic things going on, I'm going to focus on individuals. I'm going to focus on, on, on sort of street level, person to person uh, drama. Mm. Um, doesn't mean there wouldn't be like a giant battle going on, but the camera is going to be on a few people. It's not going to be at the top of the hill looking at, you know, the whole thing, if, you, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, because that's that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in how people deal with with uh, crises, with character defining situations. So that's always a challenge. <laughs> no matter the uh, no matter the setting. In fact, if it, if I don't find it challenging, then I'm probably not not doing something right. I'm probably not working hard enough. Uh, but as far as the world building, you know, uh, there's there's challenges that are unique to creating uh, an original fantasy setting or as much as if you were to create a book that was set on an alien world for a, a science fiction story, right? Um, mm -hmm. There are just, um, there's stuff you got to figure out so that the world is internally consistent and so that it all kind of hangs together and makes sense, not just for window dressing, but so that it all serves the story. Uh, right. the, that's the main thing, you know, it's not so important that we all know exactly what shade of green the grass is on this alien world. Um, but if that was important to the story, then yeah, I'd figure it out and have a reason for it. Um, there's, uh, I mean, the shapers world is, I know what star in the sky it actually circles. Um, it's it's an actual place and i've got the the astronomy figured out because i needed to i needed to know <laughs> well because i needed to know yeah. things like how long is the day you okay know, yeah. I, I didn't i didn't want to do something just so simple as you know it's basically earth but it's not earth right it's 24 hours there's a moon that looks like the moon there's <laughs> wow. why, not, why not just set it on earth if i'm going to do all that you know right so um but the challenge getting back to the, the question uh, is to not go too deeply down that rabbit hole, you know, cause I, I know a lot of world builders who writers who are world builders first and they never really get around to the writing. Mm. They, mm -hmm. they get comfortable um, figuring out every little biome and all the ecology and, you know, uh, the the history down to the the, the minute and <laughs> you know they're they're filling all the cracks in the wall and then they kind of not to speak too unkindly but they then they wall themselves in and they they never get around to telling the story exactly uh, I have fallen into that trap uh, in in my life so I I can speak, <laughs> I can speak about it as someone who's climbed out you know uh, <laughs> um, so you know. So that's a challenge, you know, knowing when to stop, uh, allowing, uh, making sure that you don't allow the, the, the world building to, to get in the way, to keep you safe from <laughs> the actual writing. Um, and, uh, but, you know, whether it's, whether it's working out a future history like the Sovereign Era, even though it takes place in the 80s, it, it carries through. Um, and, and, you know, how do these superpowers work and all that kind of stuff or working out a completely different world's history uh, and, and the interacting relationships between the species that live there and the, and the intelligent life that lives there. Um, it, I, I wouldn't say one or the other is more challenging or less challenging. They're just different questions that, that have to be answered uh, to the extent that the story requires it. Mm. um yeah and well, that's uh, that's a good answer though that, that's a good answer it's i for myself i've learned that i really enjoy writing in reality because i know that but at the same time i'm writing a sci-fi and although it's here on earth i have aliens that one alien became three races of alien that became something larger and i'm slowly going wait a minute i i gotta 
what did I call them? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you got to keep track of that kind of stuff and, and make sure I, I'm trying not to go too far down that rabbit hole because I've done, like you said, I've done the same thing. I've gone into that rabbit hole of putting up that wall of, of other details that ultimately didn't matter. Yeah. Uh, to the story it's like it mattered to me like it, it's it's information we need to know as the author so that we can write the story but yeah to the reader they're like yeah i, I didn't know that <laughs> yeah yeah and you know i talk about serving the story and whatnot one of the sort of pre-writing exercises i did before i started actually writing light of the outsider was to just kind of almost like brainstorming on paper, I wrote out the backstories of, of the, the principal characters up to the, the, like the moment before the book begins, you know, or their appearance in the book happens. Oh. Um, and I only had the vaguest idea of who these people were, but as I was writing, I found that a couple of interesting things happened. Number one, I was answering questions about the world that I hadn't really asked myself because I had to in the context <laughs> of what I was writing, you know? Right. Um, and it, I realized that in the backstories of most of these characters is uh, four or five short stories that I could write of each of them, you know? So that's how a story world kind of develops, you know, is, is you begin to realize that, that, uh, you know, these characters had lives before the thing that you're writing now. And they're pretty interesting now, hopefully. So how did they get that way? How, you know, their own origin stories or their own chapters in their own lives. I mean, this is why we read memoirs from people who are, who are real. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people have interesting chapters in their lives and fictional characters are no different. And, and uh, uh, so that was an example of going just deep enough that I ended up actually kind of opening new doors for new stories, you know? So again, there Very we are, cool. serve, serve the story. And, uh, and uh, it's uh, so, yeah, now it's just, you know, okay, just live long enough to tell them all. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh my gosh. That sounds incredible. And that's very well done to have the, um, the windows or the doorways available to you now so you can take it one way or another and, and uh, put in these other stories. That's, that's amazing. Thanks. I mean, you know, it, it, it's still all, all that remains is to actually do it. So that's, that's, that's where the real work goes in. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Well, you've got to let us know when the others are available so that we can make sure and share that with, with all of our listeners and tell everybody that uh, the next one is available. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, uh, you know, uh, the light of the outsider of course is available now. Um, and you can get it in, uh, ebook through Amazon, through paperback, through, uh, in paperback through Amazon or anywhere else that you buy paperbacks online. The audiobook is coming. Uh, I'm in the middle of editing and producing that right now. So, uh, it's, it's toward the end of July as we speak. I'm hoping by September that'll be out there in the world. Uh, and, uh, and the second book, probably the middle of next year, uh, uh, shadow of the outsider will, will come next. And, uh, but there'll be little things between then and now, uh, <laughs> a novella, a short story, you know, there'll be, there's always stuff. Folks can go to Matt Selznick.com, uh, M A T T S E L Z N I C K.com. And, um, you know, you can sign up to the mailing list there and, and uh, you'll get my first novel that we talked about, Brave Men Run. You'll get that for free if you sign up. And of course, you will then be uh, in the pipeline to know when I've got stuff to tell you about as far as uh, new creations and things like that. Outstanding. So, Outstanding. I like how I just slipped that plug in there. Yes, so, so. yes. You, you beat me by just a, just a hair there. I was about I've to done this before. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, we'll, and we will definitely have links to all that in the show notes. Everybody make sure you click on there to follow Matthew and, and check out his blog, check out the other books available. And just, I've been in his website there. You're going to spend a couple of hours wandering <laughs> around and checking out everything he has to offer. So click that link in the show notes and get on over to check out Matt. Matt, thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been a real, real 
joy getting to talk to you. Real good time. I've had a lot of fun. I'm glad we were able to do it. Me too. Ladies and gentlemen, with that said, it's time for me to sit back, have a drink, and I don't know, maybe a cigar. We'll see how I feel. It's time for our guest, Matthew Wayne Selznick, to read a sample chapter from Light of the Outsider. All right, so this is chapter two. I'm going to read a portion of chapter two because it's, it's a bit long. Uh, and uh, we pick up with Lama, who is one of our, our two first characters that you meet. Uh, and she's up to something sneaky. So here we go. This is chapter two, the first part of chapter two, Light of the Outsider. The silent, narrow launderer's warren was dimly lit by a few glow globes. It was well after curfew, and everyone's doors were closed. Lama padded to the outer door and unlatched it with care. Palace Yard staff were allowed into the yard after curfew to drain the valve, so she had that ready excuse if she needed it. So much the better if no one knew she was out of their apartment at all. Fortunately, Vadi had always been a loud one. Maig and Jaff and everyone else in the adjacent apartments would think Lama, Sot, and their guests were occupied with each other and in for the evening. As there were few secrets in the close quarters the launderers shared, it wouldn't take long tomorrow for the entire Warren to believe it, too. By then, Lama and Sot would be gone. But first, Lama had to cross the palace yard. And then, and then, she checked the pockets of her shift. There was Vadi's precious key, and there, wrapped in an oiled skin, was the special square of foul-scented cloth the magicker had given Sot. She had everything she needed. Blood pounded in her skull. She gritted her teeth, closed her eyes, exhaled slowly through her nose, opened her eyes, opened the door. The launderer's warren was built right up against the wall, nearly as far from the palace as could be to keep the acrid odor of detergents and solvents out of the delicate noses of the Alwardendon and company. It still seemed a short stroll by the light of day. By night, it was a vast expanse with few opportunities for cover. Lama closed the door behind her and glanced up and over her shoulder to the top of the wall, ten stride above the warren roof. No guards patrolled, at least not here, now. She stepped away from the warren, took another step and another, even as a desperate tension between her shoulder blades screamed for her to turn around to confirm that she was not, or was, being watched, she continued on. Nearly lost in the pale gray reflected light from the canopy of flat clouds overhead was the unremarkable wooden door at the base of the North Tower, her destination. No farther than any other time no farther than when she delivered laundry to the palace staff waiting there so many times in the last decade. So far away tonight, as far as salvation was near. She kept her eyes on the door as best she could and her focus on the soft shushing of her sandaled feet against the packed earth of the yard. There was nowhere to go but forward. She ground her teeth. She had been standing still for eight years, standing still or falling back. There was nowhere to go but forward. Earlier today, thinking about the walk to come, she noted the tall stack of hay bales about a third of the way between the launderer's warren and the tower. It was just ahead now. A beckoning black patch of shadow pooled there. She made for it. Not twelve stride from the shelter of darkness, Lama saw a small figure emerge from that shadow. Lama stopped cold with an automatic, superstitious dread she quickly suppressed. This was no night fane or flight thing skulking around the palace yard. 
It was a, a child, surely. A little girl. Lana quickly crossed the space between them. It was Seppi, Tala's daughter, born two years after Lama and Sot had come to work behind the palace wall, and still too young to do much more than play with her pet twig hopper and be underfoot. Of course, Seppi knew Lama on sight. The little girl seemed relieved to see her, even if her eyes went wide when Lama took her by the bony wrist and quickly almost dragged her back to the concealing shadow of the hay bales. Seppi, Lama snapped through clenched teeth, you know better than to be out in the yard at night. What are you doing? From somewhere outside of herself, Lama worked a bleak calculus. Before the girl could answer the first question, Lama had another, with which she hoped to assign value to a very important variable. Does your mother know you're not in bed? Does anyone? Seppi glanced at Lama's tight fingers wrapped around her arm and tugged. Lama relaxed her grip slightly, but did not let go. It was very difficult to keep the rage out of her voice. I'm not angry with you, Seppi. She would not be stopped, not like this. Why are you out in the yard after curfew all alone? Seppi seemed defiant, even if her face was flush and her eyes wet. She kept her voice down, which told Lama the little girl knew she was doing something wrong and feared discovery by anyone else. That was good. Valu, she whispered. He got out. Her pet. Lama crouched down so she could look Seppi in the eyes. She maintained the grip on her tiny arm. This is important, Seppi. Very important. Did Kala say you could run around in the yard after dark and look for Valu? Seppi looked at her dirty bare feet. No. Did anyone tell you not to come out here? Nobody knows. Seppi raised her eyes and looked around, obviously hoping to catch a glimpse of the missing twig hopper somewhere in the dark. I was really quiet. Ma never even woke up. Seppi. Look at me, Seppi. She did. You have to go back to bed, Seppi, right now. Seppi shook her head violently. I have to find Valu. That time, it was not a whisper. Lama flinched and involuntarily twisted to scan the top of the wall behind her. No guards. Not yet. The cold anxiety that had pushed at her shoulders now crawled all over. She had to get to the cover of the tower. Had to. There would be no other chance to get free of this stagnant, awful life. Lama took hold of Seppi's shoulders. Do you want the guard to hear? Seppi paled and shrank. No. She could not allow Seppi to foul this for her. Lama looked into the girl's eyes, where fear began to bloom. A natural reaction. A wise one. Choices flashed on the stage behind Lama's forehead her hands on the back of Seppi's head, shoving the girl's face into the thick wall of hay until she was silent and still. One hand holding the girl's wrists behind her back, another over her mouth and nose, until she was silent and still. Lama was strong. It would only take a moment to squeeze the girl's windpipe until she was silent and still. Another image, a memory. Lamas, never born, unfairly small and bloody and blue on the dusty floor of the latrine, silent and still. Lama's hands shook on Seppi's shoulders. There was one more option. She exhaled heavily. Seppi, when you put out Valu's food, doesn't he come running, no matter where he is? No matter how long it's been since you've seen him? I guess so. He's never far away from his food, is he? I guess not. Lama nodded. That's right. So, I'd wager that when you put out his food, come Tawake tomorrow. Seppi's voice carried a note of small hope. You think he'll come running? I know I never want to be far away from my first meal. I bet you don't either. 
Seppi gave this serious thought, then nodded. Lama slowly released Seppi's shoulders. So will you go back to the warren and climb back into bed and do it very quietly and wait for Valu to come to you tomorrow? But what if he's cold tonight or gets lonely? Well, then he'll come back before first meal then, won't he? Because he expects you to be in your bed, all warm, where he can find you. The most convincing thing Lama could say bloomed in her head. What if he's there now, looking for you? That did it. Seppi took a step toward the warren. You're right. Lama's knees threatened to buckle from relief. She need not murder a child tonight. Seppi, wait. But, Valu, I know. I just want to make sure you know you shouldn't tell anyone you are out here. You know that, yes? Seppi nodded. I know. She looked over her shoulder and back at Lama. But why are you in the yard, Lama? Don't worry about that, Seppi. Just remember, your ma and the guards and Warden Tupu, they'd be very angry if they found out you broke curfew. But you are too. Despair threatened. The little girl was too stride away. If need be, Lama could be on her, quickly. With luck, she could snap her neck before Seppi had a chance to scream. Assuming her earlier outburst hadn't already caused someone to stir, if not on the wall, then in one of the yard warrens, or even in the palace itself. I'm going to tell you a secret, Seppi. Seppi's mouth opened, and her eyes got big. Lama continued, A very powerful magicker asked me to do something very important. Do you know what magickers can do? Seppi nodded. She'd undoubtedly heard the same stories Kug had told Lama when she was a little girl. Scary things. Oh, yes. Very scary things. Lama rolled her eyes to the sky. Did you know he's watching me right now to make sure I do a good job? He is? From far, far away. With magic. And do you know what he'll do if anyone finds out about this? Seppi shook her head. I don't either, Seppi, Lama intoned. But you can guess, can't you? You know the story of the Gundi Mog of the East, don't you? Remember what happened to that little girl? Seppi nodded slowly. Her staring gaze never strayed from Lama. So you and I, Lama said. We don't want anyone to know we were out here, or... Seppi bit her lip. I won't tell anyone, Lama. Lama made a show of gratitude, a big sigh of relief, clasping her hands at her breast. Thank you, Seppi. Now hurry, but be sneaky. Get back to bed. Seppi ran. Lama wanted to curse. How long had that taken? How long had she been gone herself? Shaper knew Sot couldn't last forever, especially not with Vadi. How long before Vadi got bored of his pounding and became restless for her? She made out Seppi opening the warren door and slipping inside. What if Tupu caught her? Would she have the sense to lie and say she'd just been to the latrine? Time bled. Lama broke from her shadowy cover and ran for the servant's door at the base of the tower. There was... Nowhere else left to go. All right, that was Matthew Wayne Selznick reading a sample chapter from his latest book, the fantasy thriller, Light of the Outsider. Oh my gosh, it was so good. The uh, And the book is available right now. So click the link in the show notes for the book, for Matthew's website, and how and where to follow him. Don't forget to also click the links for our podcast friends and sponsors alike and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out next time when i'm back with a brand new author a new book and a new sample chapter (laughs) thanks for sticking it out with me this time guys and uh, i promise i'll be better next time (laughs) take care
This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.